Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to come together. Uh, uh, this nice group of uh, members that have sacrificed their time. And even though it's very hot out there, they're here praising you and honoring you. So we ask a special blessing for all of them. Uh, for those that are not here, Lord, and for the prayer requests that we have uplifted today, uh, that you may reach each and every uh, request and that you may answer it according to your will. That uh, once we step out of this church, or at this moment if you want to, that you may answer uh, those prayers, O oh Lord, for healing, for blessings, for protection. We, we include uh, Wendy's nephew. We just hear that he was hit by a car today, that you may provide healing for him. And uh, we honor you and thank you that he's alive and that uh, it wasn't even, you know, more dangerous or worse. But uh, we pray for him. We pray for our school, our students, our teachers, our parents, our community, O oh Lord, that we may be able to increase in size and, uh, and in all kinds of assets, O oh Lord, that our, our academy will be a, uh, continues to be an instrument of salvation uh, in this community, O oh Lord. Bless uh, in a mighty way, bless our pastors, our churches in this area as well, that all together will continue to do your work in advancing the second coming of the Lord. Thank you for listening to our prayer this uh, evening. And we ask that you may continue to speak, to speak to us through our study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, today we're going to be talking about, and this is our 11th um, study. We got one more next week. Uh, Judas Iscariot, the traitor. And uh, I hope that you may enjoy our presentation tonight. So we have studied everyone except Peter, which we're going to see Peter next week, Wednesday night. So the tra let's see the traitor. Let's see what the Bible says about him. Uh, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him, Mark chapter 3. In Luke 6, again, the same thing. Uh, Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor in John 12. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, so you see, all, all these passages go around his action, his, uh, you know, uh, really bad action of, of, of betraying Jesus. Uh, Mark chapter 14, then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And we know the story. Matthew 27, and he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed. And then he went away and hanged himself. Uh, what a sad story, right, for a guy who was in the inner circle of Jesus' trust individuals. Uh, he was not only in the inner circle, he was the treasure of Jesus' church here on earth. Uh, so his attitude, uh, we can gather, was like my way or the highway, right? He was just, uh, you know, an individual that needed to be in control, very manipulative. Uh, so Judas Iscariot is mentioned over 16 times in the scriptures, each of them narrating a very sad story. He was a very close uh, disciple to Jesus, and yet for a while he planned to betray him. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting that uh, as he got in, uh, let me say this about him. He's the, uh, the only one of the disciples that, were not, that was not a Galilean. He was from the southern part of Israel. So he was half Jew, half Arab. And, uh, and that's why he was perhaps, you know, the outsider of the group. But yet Jesus embraced him. Jesus, you know, uh, you know embraced him and allowed him to be in this uh, inner circle. And, and uh, you know, but he started to plant. He, he was looking to get rid of the Roman, uh, you know, burden, the Roman pressure and uh, when he saw Jesus as a possibility, he joined them. But, uh, you know, when Jesus went the other way, his kingdom was celestial, heavenly, rather than earthly. Uh, he decided to betray him. He says he's no longer, uh, you know, a good instrument of getting rid of, of the Romans. So perhaps he realized way before any other disciple that Jesus' kingdom would not overtake the Romans. And that's why he betrayed him. He started planning about it, And when you start planning something every day in your mind, in your thought, you know what happens usually when you think something, when you think, uh, think a lot about something, you know, that something becomes part of your life. 
Uh, for example, I, uh, you know, some experts say that when, when children are told they're dumb or they don't do, uh, they're not good enough, you know what? They grow believing that. And when they grow into adulthood, you know, usually they have some mental issues and, and personality issues because, they, they, you know, they, they don't think that they're worth uh, to be alive or to be a, a right person. So, uh, you know, you have to understand that he started planning this for a while. He might have been disappointed and frustrated that the church wasn't running his way, right? Uh, his motto was, my way or the highway, like I just mentioned, and he was a treasurer of the group. Now, as we know, in John chapter 12, the Bible says that this guy uh, started stealing from the bag. Uh, now, do you think that Jesus and the other disciples would notice this? Perhaps no, perhaps yes, but Jesus knew. And that's why Jesus said this. As the treasurer, he would keep the money. Jesus and his disciples used to travel around Israel uh, to do ministry, right? So it was an important individual keeping an important asset. Food was purchased from this. Uh, perhaps taxes were paid as, as well uh, from this. Money for lodging and for using boats on the lake. Uh, usually people, if you were not working for somebody in the lake, uh, you will not have access to a boat. So in order for you to be in a boat, you have to rent it. Uh, so they needed money. So, However, Judas Iscariot was stealing money from their purse, according to John 12. The Bible reads, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Now, this is Jesus doing a miracle, right? Uh, and, and this lady bringing the perfume. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor, he said? It was worth a year's wages. Now, if you make $50,000 a year, that's a lot of money. That's what the, the perfume uh, costs, right? So he did not say this, the Bible says, because he cared about the poor, but because he was a what? A thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used, he used to help himself to what was put into it, the Bible says. And this is a revelation by Jesus, right? So, uh, therefore, he was a thief. He was stealing the money. Now, Judas Iscariot, the man, let me uh, introduce you a little bit about him. In his name in Hebrew was Judas, uh, the man from Kariath. Now, Kariath uh, was a city. There were two Kariaths mentioned in the Bible, uh, one in Moab. Moab is in the eastern side of the river Jordan. Uh, and the other one was in the southern part of uh, Judea in an area called Indumia, Idumia. And uh, El Corientin is the name of the current city, 10 miles south of Hebron. Uh, it, was a, it is a harsh environment in terms of the weather, very intense and hot temperatures in that area. This is the, the desert of, of sin, the Bible mentions in the Bible. Uh, it is a place for Bedouin's lifestyle. Uh, which is suitable for this place. Uh, and there's in interesting that Bedouins are, you know, in Ju Judas was a Bedouin of heart, uh, a wanderer, an opportunistic. And it's incredible to say this about the Bedouin. If you go today to Israel, you will see them flourishing in the middle of the desert. How do they do that? How can they flourish in the middle of sand and stone and rocks and wilderness? How can they survive? Well, they're experts. They read the stars. They follow the moon. And, and they, with the moon, they know when to plant. And when they move around and they, you know, take care of the flocks and uh, sheep or cows or whatever animals they have or camels. And, and these people are very, very, you know, thriving in the middle of the desert. And, but they're very opportunistic. They, will, they understand when an opportunity will come to them and they grab it. And perhaps... Judah being, Judas being from this area, perhaps he had that mentality, that lifestyle of being an opportunistic, opportunistic individual. Uh, so he became a disciple of Christ. He said, maybe this is a guy that would free us, free us from the Romans, right? So he, he went on and he got into the, wagon, into the wagon. Now, not only that, but he was trusted by Jesus. He was good enough to, you know, gain the trust of Jesus, enough to make him treasurer uh, but unfortunately, he was squandering that, thr that trust. As a treasurer, he stole from the money bag. He wasn't a team worker. He only thought about himself. Uh, it seemed that his only goal in life was to satisfy his needs himself. He was part 
of the trusted circle of Jesus' team, but he wasn't a good teammate. Now, have, are you a good teammate? How many good, good teammates we have in here? Amen? Are you a good, good teammate of Jesus? Right? And he wasn't. Uh, it's interesting what the Bible says. Uh, why was Judah invited? And I'm taking you to another story for a second just to show you why God shows him, why Jesus shows him. Uh, in Genesis chapter 50, we get the story of Joseph who is explaining God's purpose for his life with regards to his brother's actions against him. Remember, his brothers sold them into slavery into Egypt. And when the famine came to the land, they found themselves in Egypt looking, searching for meal, for food, right? And who they find there? They find his brother Joseph was in charge. He survived it, and he was in charge. And we know the story. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the reason, this is what he said in Genesis 50. You intended to harm me, he, said, he told his brothers. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You see, what, what Joseph was saying is that God takes the negative, and he what? Turns it into what? Into positive. Sometimes we lose a family members. We have a death in our family. We have uh, a disease or an illness in our family. And we don't understand why. And yet God knows why. God knows everything, every reason. Anything that happens in our lives, he understands. And he's in control. But we need to understand that and accept his will. Uh, and this is why, you know, somehow Judas was chosen by God himself. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, G, uh, Ju, uh, Judas' uh, choosing was even uh, set in prophecy in the Bible, in different uh, uh, verses of the Bible that we'll see later. But another fact is that Judas was not a Galilean, like I mentioned to you. Uh, in a sense, he was an outsider who learned to gain trust from people. Uh, trust gaining was, was a good, positive attitude he had. So he would become very friendly. I imagine he was this guy that would put your hand on, on you, you know, that if he saw you quiet, he would go to you, hey, what's up, man? You know, he would light up your day because he was a, this type of individual, very friendly, because that was one method he would survive, and he learned how to master that. Uh, so he became, uh, you know, gained trust of, from people. The Galileans were from the fructiferous north section of Israel, while Judah's uh, land was from the barren, desertic south. Right? So you see the opposite, where they're coming from. And that affected who they were. Uh, although he was chosen, it seems like he never fit in. He saw the other disciples as possible threat. Uh, and that's why he stole from them. Uh, so why Judas? Why Judas? Well, the prophetic component comes in. Uh, there is a debate among biblical scholars as to why some human beings have been chosen to be saved and others chosen to die. Uh, however, it is our understanding that our God know the intentions of our heart as, we, as he also knows our choices and decisions. And I, I give you, for example, one example. Why the, uh, Lot's wife had to die? Right? Good question. Because God intended to save her as well, right? But why she died? Why she became a pillar of faith, uh, a pillar of salt? It was because her disobedience, her decision, right? It was, so, but God allowed that. God knew that was coming, and yet he did not stop it because it is our decision. And, and that's what happens there, like uh, we are saying. It is our understanding then that God's intention, he knows our heart. Uh, if a human being ultimately will choose not to follow him, he would, he would, know, uh, he would, know, that from, he would know that from the beginning. Therefore, uh, you know, he would... Not try to stop it. He would try to convince that individual to turn around, but he would not force himself into that individual. And that's what happens to our friend, our friend Judas. The Bible in John 17 says, While I was with them, I protected them, and I kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except, listen to what Jesus said about Judah, the one doomed to destruction so that Scripture will be fulfilled. That's what Jesus said about Judas. What is Jesus saying? That basically he was chosen, right, for the job he was doing, the betrayal of Jesus, right? In Psalm 41, we read, even my close friend, whom I trusted, he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. 
That's a prophecy by David about Jesus and Judas. In Luke 22, but behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table, Jesus said. So Jesus clearly knew that Judas was going to betray him. In Psalm 55, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend, but he stretched out his hand against his friends. Again, the prophecy of, of betrayal. And, uh, you know, that was very, very, uh, uh, you know, we can see that in the life of Judas. But still, he was still chosen by God. Judas, chosen by Jesus, was the church's treasurer, and none of the other disciples had any idea he would be the betrayer. Uh, often, God uses evil for good. Again, Joseph saying, you intended to harm me, but God intended for good to accomplish what is being done, right? However, God is never the author of evil. That is a human decision. Uh, so uh, Judas's evil did not come from God's choosing. God chose him so that he could turn around, but he rejected that uh, uh, initiative by God. It was his decision. In Exodus 33, we read, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Now, what uh, that entails is that God is willing to have compassion on human beings. But if you reject that compassion, he will not have compassion on you. Right? And, and that's what it is. It's our decision. We are the one that um, uh, make that decision. We cannot know why, and it's not for us to guess why God chooses this way. Only God knows why, and that should be enough for us. Since we don't have the ability to choose God but rather he chooses us, then we need to praise God for his choosing. Even though we don't deserve it, even though we're not worth it, yet still God chooses you. And sometimes, you know, it's not because he makes mistakes. He chooses you and you betray him. We betray him and we become disobedient to him. And that is a sad story, but that's, that's the reality. It's our decision. Judas in Christianity... Let me say this, Judas, whose betrayal of the master led to Jesus' crucifixion, is reviled in, in mainstream Christianity as a man of weak morals. Uh, he has become the synonym of a person who betrays a higher cause, although he, hasn't, he wasn't the only disciple to betray Jesus, as we remember Peter. Peter betrayed Jesus too, right? He rejected him three times, right? Uh, Judas' story historically has become justification for the persecution of the Jewish community because other, uh, other Christians from other uh, countries and, and, and ethnic groups uh, accused the Jews of killing Jesus. So they, it is true. That's what they did. But, you know, they take on Judas' uh, uh, action as their uh, uh, way to accuse them. Uh, one of the most famous works uh, with regards to describing what Judas this, uh, did uh, in lit literature came from Dante, who wrote Inferno. And this uh, masterpiece by Dante depicts Judas as an evil character, condemned to the lower circle of hell. And uh, this, this story about Inferno is basically the, a reference to what Judas did against Jesus. What did he do? The kiss of death, right? Judas carried the distinction of being the first disciple to die. Remember, the first disciple to be, to be marked, to be killed, was James. He was, they, they, they stabbed him with a sword, and then they behead him. But, but the first one to die was Judas. He killed himself. We know the story. As the mob came close to the Garden of Gethsemane that night, Judas received 30 pieces of silver for his betrayal, very similar to what Jacob's uh, sons got when they sold Joseph into, uh, into slavery, they got 20 shekels of silver, which by the time of Jesus' day was equivalent to 30 pieces of silver. Uh, so it, it was basically a type of, uh, of selling and betrayal. That makes Joseph a type of Jesus and Joseph's brothers a type of Judas. And uh, you know, then the question comes to mind is, why was, were the, uh, the type of Judah in terms of uh, Joseph's brothers were able to receive repentance and forgiveness? Why didn't Judas? Well, again, a personal decision. 
He did not allow it. What did he do? Once he returned the money, what did he do? He went to the wilderness and hanged himself. That's a decision. And when a human being makes that decision, now, let me say this. Even when a person is dying that way, you never know what, you know, what connection this individual can make in the brain, in the mind, with God. Only God knows that process. Uh, so I'm not going to accuse them and say, because he did that, because he took his life, he's going to hell. I don't know that. Only God knows that. But he made that decision to reject God, and that is obvious for the action he made. Now, what is Judas' contribution? Because he was so negative, and he's so, uh, you know, his attitude of, of rejecting Jesus. So what is his contribution? Well, his unfortunate decision testify to you and I the true outcome of rejecting God. And that is a benefit for you and I. When we see what he did, we can avoid what he did, right? Betrayal that leads into insatisfaction, that leads into suicide. And, uh, although a sinner, Jesus gave him a second chance. That's a good thing to understand. That even though we might be sinners and not worthy, still Jesus gives us the embracement, the forgiveness, and the uh, acceptance Knowing that type of person he was, Jesus did not hesitate in giving him a chance to produce, to repent, right? Even knowing he was stealing, he allowed him to remain. That is a tough one. Even though Jesus knew, John 14, uh, 12, we just read that. He knew he was stealing. He didn't stop it. Why? Why did Jesus just, just kept it quiet? He didn't tell the other disciples either. He knew it, but he didn't stop it. Do you think that Jesus intended or perhaps secretly tried to talk to Judas to stop that? Maybe he did. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that, but I don't know how he handled that, but he kept it quiet, right? And he allowed him to remain. Uh, that sin doesn't pay, right? That's another thing that we learned from Judas. That when we do sin and when we are disobedient, sin doesn't pay. Right? Even though he got 30 shekels of silver, which would have made him, you know, to live for a lot, many years. And yet, sin doesn't pay. The question is then, on whose side are you? You see, Judas was in the inner circle of Christ. And yet, he was not with Christ. He was close to him in the same area of Jesus. But he was in another galaxy. <laughs> his heart, his, his mind were totally against God. How about us? Where are we today? Are we a good friend of Jesus so that people say, oh, he's the treasurer, he's the head elder, he's the pastor, he's the leader of the church, he's the speaker, he's the evangelist, he's the singer. Is that why we are close to Jesus? Where are we? Who are we? On what side are we on? That's the question I have for you tonight. And I pray that each and every one of you tonight will be able to be on the side of Jesus. It's not appearances, but from the heart, that you may be able to open your heart and allow that change and that transformation that only comes when we open our hearts to him, to Jesus. If that is you tonight, that you are willing to open your heart to Jesus, will you stand so that we can pray tonight? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to review what the life of Judas was. He, he did not become an evangelist. He did not do Bible studies. He did not share the gospel he learned from you with anybody. What he did was betray Jesus, and then he committed suicide. We don't know if he, he will be in heaven. We don't know that. Only you know that. Only you have that reservation to know what the future will be and, and what will happen in eternity. But we know that his action was wrong. We know that he disobeyed you. We know that that decision
tell us today that the outcome of disobedience to you uh, ends up in the wrong pathway. And we ask, O oh Lord, that each and every one of us will be, remain faithful to you, that we'll be able to choose you and to become your friends from the heart, from the mind, from our relationship uh, with you, from our connection with you. And help us, O oh Lord, to uh, help others as well in the way. Judas wasn't able to help anybody. So help us, O oh Lord, share the gospel with some people that we may be able to become your instruments of salvation. Bless us tonight as we return home. Give us uh, traveling mercies and help us to be here on Sabbath. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Next week, our final presentation on this series is Peter, the church leader. And I hope that you will be able to be here to enjoy that. God bless you and you have a blessed night.